Lynn. So thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited that we have such a great group um, in attendance and our, our panel of experts as well. Um, so today for the next 30 minutes, we're going to discuss our recent paper titled An Investigation into the Impact of Pre-Adolescent Training on Canine Behavior, which was published recently in the journal Animals. This was an open access paper, meaning it's free for anyone to read. Um, and joining us are the, the authors today, two of the three authors. So we have world-renowned veterinary behaviorist and CCBS, Dr. Nicholas Dodman, um, along with Vivian Satola, who in addition to being a research associate for CCBS, is an applied anthrozoologist and owner operator of Boston Canine Concierge, which is a dog training service in Boston Metro West area. Ian Didwoody is also an author on the paper and was going to be able to join us. Hopefully he'll be able to pop in, um, but he had a last minute conflict. He's the chief data analyst for CCBS. And um, you know, rounding out our group is Donna Gleason, who's also a professional dog trainer. Um, she's not available to join us either, but we have a really great group, a great team from CCBS. And we're a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to improving the lives of dogs and those who love them through our studies and education. So we appreciate you joining us once more. Um, donations are encouraged and welcome. And there's a little bit of a, um, a special uh, prize maybe for those who attend today. So stay tuned till the end of that and I'll, I'll share more about that. So to get us started, um, how about we have uh, Dr. Dodman, if you'd like to start with an introduction to the paper. And okay. uh, be before I, <laughs> I take it back, just want to remind everyone that we are recording. Um, you're welcome to share your video screen with us or you can stay muted um, video wise. We do ask you to stay muted as the authors are discussing and then we'll answer questions afterward as well. Very good. So let's get going. So what we do is we, um, speaking amongst ourselves in our weekly meetings, um, we sometimes talk about you know topics of interest and things that we would like to know the answer to. And one of the things that I came up with was um, sort of a, what was a revelation for me some years ago. Um, I was editing and co-writing and contributing to a book called Puppy's First Steps um, with Lawrence Lindner, who is a professional writer and the faculty at Tufts Veterinary School. And we were talking about the age of puppy training, um, what's good and what's bad. And working from first principles, I thought the best thing to do was to train them when they're in the sensitive period of learning. And to answer one question already, um, the term critical period of learning has now been um, surpassed by sensitive period of learning. Um, when it was first described by Scott and Fuller, it was from two to 10 weeks of age was the critical period of learning. Since then, with the name change, the sensitive period is now regarded as being from three weeks to 12 or 14 weeks. So that's the first principle I was working from. And I thought, well, you know, puppy training really shouldn't start after veterinarians demand all the vaccinations are in place before you take your puppy for puppy training, you know, wait until four months, then you bring him because, hey, you've missed the sensitive period of learning. Surely it's gotta be better to train a dog during that period where they absorb like a sponge. Um, and I thought from first principles, I could just make that statement, which we did in the book. And about a year later, my college, the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists, whether it's because of me or independently, they came up with the same thing and they started preaching, you know, don't wait for all the vaccinations to be complete. Um, puppies are protected by maternal antibodies for about, you know, six, seven, eight, nine weeks. And then the first vaccinations take over from there. So they're kind of protected anyway. I mean, be sensible, don't take them into the you know, dog park where there's you know, millions of germs and stuff, you know, to start with as puppies. Um, but try and get them out as early as possible to, to hang with the vaccination, so to speak. So American College of Veterinary Behaviors did that, and then that was followed shortly by the American Veterinary Medical Association. So now everyone's on the same bandwagon. So I thought to myself, is it true? So the hypothesis of this study would be that it was true. We say, 
yes, we believe that puppy training in the first, say, three, three and a half months would be much more effective than puppy training in the months four, five, and six. Um, so we designed this survey to look exactly at that and to see what that hypothesis was true. And there was another part of it is that if you take your dog to puppy training, does it have any long-term benefits from you other than perhaps that your dog has learned to sit and stay or walk to heel or some such? Um, are there any other benefits that accrue for bringing a young dog in the first six months of life, either the first three, the next three, um, does it affect them down the road? And we had uh, control dogs too who hadn't been to puppy training and we had different numbers of sessions they'd attended and the style of training. We asked all those questions. So that was what the study was about. That's how we started it. And Vivian is gonna take over and explain something about the questions we developed and the answers we got. Vivian, before you get started, I'm curious, um, how many have had a chance to read the paper in full? Um, if you'd like to, in the chat, you can say yes or no. That would be interesting for us to know. All right, Viv, you're up. Um, it's a quick question. Shall I talk about the, the analysis summary or go into the questionnaire? Um, I guess the questions are fairly self-evident. You know, no, the I mean, first... I mean, First questions were about, you know, the uh, signal, what we call signalment, age, breed, well, sex. Yeah. I, so, 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 yeah. So the 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 as a team, we um, we constructed the questions and um, massaged them a bit. Um, there's about thirty eight questions, uh, which you can download. Um, from animals, and um, as many of you know, the uh, paper itself is free, um, and so it's open access. Um, so yeah, we have the 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 questions were divided in um, essentially three categories. Um, we asked people who had been to puppy training, and also those who had not. You know, we we do have a control group, um, those that had, um, we wanted to find a, a, a profile, have a profile on the dogs. And so that would be their sex, their age. So we wanted to know if they went to training in the first three months and also um, uh, four to six months. Um, we looked at um, if they could, how many classes they attended, if the dogs were neutered, um, and then the second category would be the techniques. We were interested in knowing what techniques were being used. And so when we talk about training and what we were really looking at was just the um, operant conditioning. So the model would be, be like the AKC puppy star good manners, right? So that's all we were looking at. Um, so techniques and also any restraining devices that were used. Um, and then the third category was uh, their interpretation of the owner's interpretation or the guardian's interpretation of uh, behaviors that their dog is presenting today. So uh, the questions again can be found. Uh, I know that Ian had uploaded the questions that can be downloaded as well from animals. Uh, so those are the questions and then um, I can speak to the analysis part if you'd like me to. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, so I'm gonna read it actually verbatim because I am, <laughs> I'm not the statistician on the team, although I, I, I'm learning. Um, so how was the data collected and how were participant, participants recruited is the question. And the answer would be data was collected via an online questionnaire. Uh, and it was open to the public for six weeks. To recruit participants, a link to the survey was emailed to all registrants, uh, at, I'm sorry, all registered CCBS members and posted to CCBS social media pages. 
another question was what analysis was performed? And the answer is binary logistic regression models were built to assess the relationship between attending pre-adolescent training and the occurrence of a specific behavior problem when the effects of confounding or intervening background variables were accounted for. A single linear regression model was built to assess the relationship between dog age in years and the likelihood of attendance. Um, in terms of significance of findings, results, our significant findings were that we found aggression compulsive behavior, destruction, destructive behavior, and excessive barking were all reduced in dogs that had attended puppy training before six months of age, compared to a con controlled group of dogs that had not attended puppy training classes. Dogs acquired as puppies at 12 weeks of age or less had reduced odds of exhibiting fear or anxiety and engaging in destructive behavior. Third, Male, male dogs were found to have reduced odds of developing aggressive behavior, con compulsive behavior, and mounting humping, and increased odds of rolling in repulsive materials. Fourth, we found neuter dogs of either sex were found to have increased odds of developing fear and anxiety, increased odds of escaping running away, exhibiting coprophagia and rolling in repulsive materials. Um, and then fifth, the odds of problem problematic jumping decreased with age. And we also last, we found the probability that a dog had attended puppy training decreased with age. In other words, puppies were more likely to be bought, I'm sorry, brought to puppy training today than they were a few years ago. Well, that's a pretty dense set of findings, but one thing that you didn't mention, which um, was really the point of the study, was do you take them to drop puppy training early or do you take them late? And the answer was when you looked at the young training group, three and a half months and below, and the older training group, four to six months, there was absolutely no difference. Right. So this is dispelling a myth, you know, a myth that I'm afraid, you know, others followed me or they didn't, they invented it themselves. But it's so important to bring them early before vaccination. And this study says, not really. As long as they're there in the first six months of life, it's fine. And we actually found another surprising finding that even very few lessons attended, like one to three lessons was enough. And I know we used to run puppy training classes at Tufts and that very first lesson was education. It was owner education about what to expect, what kind of tools and equipment to use, a little bit of stuff about various vaccinations and positive reinforcement, operant training. And even just that one session is enough to put them on the right road, but one to three. Um, and there was, you know, if you attended four or five or 10 or 11, it didn't make any difference. The results were the results. So attending puppy training at any age in the first six months has the same beneficial effects versus a control group who didn't. And as Vivian just said, there was a decrease in aggression, which is a really useful thing to have happen. At least, got to say it accurately, reduced odds of the dog developing aggression, reduced odds of destructive behavior, reduced odds of barking, um, annoyingly, you know, they all bark, but just annoying barking, excessive, and reduced odds of developing an obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a sort of specialty interest of mine. And I was very curious as to why that might be, but um, there it was a finding that we couldn't deny. And so it was, uh, we did try to look at whether punitive puppy training would had. Our opposite effects, that was one of the reader questions coming in. I can't remember who wrote that question, but um, the answer is we, we, we seriously believe that <clears throat> puppy training, um, all of us believe that if you're puppy training using um, P plus positive uh, punishment, um, whether it's, you know, chokes or prongs or even whipping on a slip collar, you know, punishment, it, it, we think that that will increase aggression down the road. But sadly, we didn't have enough people whose puppies were trained 
using punishment to actually be able to make a statement about it. We can't say statistically or significantly that it's a bad thing to do, but we'd like to, and maybe we'll be able to prove it in a further study. It's very difficult to prove. So I think that just about covers the, um, the paper. Um, and I think we could probably open it up for questions because we're, we're at the 417 mark and we're going to try and wrap up shortly around 430 and there's several questions that people have asked and we want to get to answer. There are, right. Um, Dr. Dobbin, did you want to talk about socialization and how oh. that affects puppies as well, but it wasn't, wasn't included in our paper specifically? No, that's a very good point because, you know, that period of time that we called the originally the um, critical period now sensitization, um, sensitive period of learning is otherwise referred to as the socialization period. That's another name for it. And socialization is maximized as Scott and Fuller said and everybody totally believes during that time. Training is a whole nother issue. Training is training them to do things and not do things and listen and understand words and um, perform certain operant behaviors that you want and so on. But socialization, that is just getting along with other dogs and people and stuff like that, that's still, what wasn't what we studied, that's still recommended as early as possible, as we had originally suggested with puppy training in uh, Puppy's First Steps book. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't mean that you can socialize, start socializing a dog at five months because the window is close to closed for socialization at that period. So people who walk around with a two-year-old dog and you say, what are you doing? They say, we're socializing him too late. Right. You know, it's gotta be done early on, but socialization and training are separate. Yeah. Of course, if you do take a puppy early to puppy training, you might catch, you know, if you're going at three months, you'll catch the tail end of the um, socialization period and mixing with other groups of puppies might be a positive experience or not, if you've got a bandit in the group who yeah. attacks your puppy, I mean, that can produce profound and long lasting learning effects in the opposite direction. So it has to be, you know, like Ian Dunbar's puppy training parties or puppy parties, you know, it has to be designed to be, dogs get on and it's a fun thing where they learn good things, not have the opposite experience. So thank you for Ali for bringing that up. Yeah, it's important about the bullies, <laughs> you know, the ones that are picking on the rest of the group, it could do more harm than good. So a balanced group is, is um, good advice. Thank you. Right. So some of the questions that we've had, um, the first question is from Laurel. Actually, the next two are from Laurel. The first is um, how epigenics factors into puppy and adolescent behavior. And you know, for rescue dogs or dogs whose genetic background is patchy, for example, they say. Well, you know, I, I guess I have to answer that one. And, um, you know, the fact is epigenetics is, you know, a sort of fashionable topic. You know, we all think our behavior is determined by our DNA, and it is to some extent. But the DNA is producing proteins and various bits of DNA and protein sequences will be performing at a certain level. They'll be making a protein at a certain level, but there are switches, um, complicated switches that will turn the DNA sort of on or off or up or down, you know, like a regulator in a shower. Um, and these are epigenetic influences. So the experiences the dog has when young will affect epigenetic factors that you can't see. And to some extent you can almost ignore in a way because it's, it's what's going on inside the engine. Like, I don't know what's going on. I don't care what goes on inside the engine of my car. I just want to drive it. But deep down inside, you know, how does that compression work and how do the wheels end up by turning around? So that's a very deep question. But sure, when you are training in a positive way, you can switch on and switch off these epigenetic factors, um, methylation and histones, which can change the switches that activate various different parts of DNA. The DNA doesn't change but you can ch change the switches. And actually those changes that are produced by epigenetic, epigenetic influences are reversible. So it's kind of a plastic system. So learning does play a part. And if you turn on the right switches that produce good effects, you're going in the right direction. Not that you know what switches were affected or whether it was a methylation process inside the body. 
Would that be true at any age or is it specific to, you know, an adolescent behavior? Because, you know, part of that question was asking about rescue dogs. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's known that environments like shelters have an effect on animal stresses. Mm -hmm. Would you say that um, there's a difference in how that stress affects a puppy versus how it affects an adult dog? Well, I, I would postulate, you know, that mm -hmm. if you take a dog who's, you know, potentially going to be a fairly normal, decent, calm, well-behaved dog, and he's put through the ringer in an early stage, that will change um, influences inside his um, genetic machinery. And he will have these epigenetic changes that will affect genes, that will affect proteins, that down the road through various pathways um, will affect behavior. So, you know, one way of thinking about it being real deep would be, you know, a dog who comes as damaged goods you know, into or out of a, re a rescue situation or shelter will have some epigenetic damage, which I said is reversible. And if you get the most severe cases and you do the right things to reverse the switches, you know, sometimes it takes about a year. You can turn that dog around uh, a good extent, but what you're doing is you're just changing the switches. Sure, sure. All right, nice. The next one, um, asks us to discuss the differences in results within the first critical imprinting period prior to 14 weeks of age and pups compared to later. So they ask, do later experiences have a significant effect or is the period end noticeable as, as generally thought? Mm. Well, I guess I could answer that too. I think that's for you, yeah. Um, so, you know, people have taken this sensitive period um, critical period, imprinting period type thing, in, uh, very literally. And the fact is, you know, I had a Japanese resident one time, and she said that in Japan, and I think this is true, that there is a secondary period of fairly intense learning that occurs, say, between three months, you know, three, three and a half months, and six months. So let's say it's not like you're learning like a sponge until you're 14 weeks, and all of a sudden the machinery is turned off it's declining. But after about six months, you know, you don't stop learning. It's just that you, you're missing a window of very rapid learning. Like for us humans, I believe it's very easy. I've read, no personal experience, but I've read that it's very easy to learn a new language when you're seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. You start trying to learn a new language when you're 30 years old, it's, it can be done. Um, it's just hard, harder. The children can learn new languages just like that. And that's the way it is with puppies that the earlier you get them, um, the more uh, pl plastic their brain systems are and the better they learn. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I want to ask a question from one of our attendees who's present with us today, Charmaine. Charmaine asked about behavioral medication for puppies eight weeks to five months. Now, Charmaine, feel free to jump in. Did you, are you asking, is there a difference in medication um, that's specific to puppies or um like what would be recommended what what do you mean uh, um not necessarily i'm a trainer so that's out of my realm as far as of course mm -hmm. what medications but um is it is it helpful for medications to be added in if needed with a, a very young puppy and the answer is yes um you know, it's not something you jump to, you know, some um, people who had an axe to grind about me and my practice would say, oh, I wouldn't take your dog to see Dr. Dodman, you know, he'll give a dog Prozac because it jumps up on you. And no, I never did. And I never would. But there are some very serious conditions that, uh, you know, Shaman was referring to. Um, for example, when Dr. Moon and I did this study, 333 bull terriers, um, looking at the age of onset of compulsive tail chasing, which is sometimes, you know, untreated as a life-threatening condition. And the bull terrier owner is absolutely horrified when they see they're three months old, we found in the study, you know, three, four, five months old, suddenly starts spinning like a top. And it's almost, you know, uh, as a calendar once said about a, a, what was a picture of a woman sitting there sprawled out and the underneath the temperature, the, the, the tagline said, beyond therapy. You know, these are almost beyond, you know, behavioral therapy. But for a dog like that, sure, you could use something like, for example, Prozac or any other medicine. 
just to try and get a handle on things, just so you can manage to get through, so you can cause some learning. Uh, and we did make a little YouTube video about some tail chasing dogs. And one of them in there, a dog called Valentine, was a very young puppy and um, did in fact, as the medicine was working, 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 it was getting better, better, better. It hadn't quite stopped. And it, actually the woman left it by the swimming pool, went in to get the phone and it spun itself into the swimming pool and drowned. So, you know, a, a few more weeks, we'd have been in better shape because this was, you know, virtually extinguishing the behavior, but she wasn't, she would have taken better care of the dog, I guess. Um, but yes, you can do that. And, you know, and children too, they have such a thing as pediatric Prozac. So if a child has some really serious condition, not just being a bad kid and banging on a table, but, you know, really serious psychological, psychiatric condition, um, pediatric Prozac is peppermint flavored, um, can be used. So you can use it in any age. And there are positive effects of it too. I don't want to go on too long, but it actually causes the development of new neurons in the brain. So it's almost like miracle grow for the brain. That's Thank great. you. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think we'll have time for one more question. Uh, Vivian, this one might be best for you and, uh, and your cute little kitty there. Um, interested, Rachel is interested in the relationship between adverse training and pre, in pre-adolescent and increased aggression. Curious what data was used um, and uh, because she'd like to reference it for clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's unethical to use any kind of punishment in, um, in a study. Uh, but uh, years ago, they, they did. We did, science did. Um, we, uh, in this, um, in our study, we did reference, um, oh, I'm so sorry, my cat's going like crazy. Trying not to get him to go outside. Uh, we did reference, uh, there's a number of um, studies that we referenced, peer-reviewed studies, and you can find them um, in the back, but specifically um, number seven, um, I should say number 12, Fox and Stetzner, 1966, uh, is showed that um, puppies, they had uh, three groups of puppies, five to six weeks, eight to nine weeks, and 12 to 13 weeks. And they were using shock with these shock um, with uh, puppies in um, evaluating whether they were um, approaching a person or not. And they would use the shock to see if they had any um, change in behavior, any avoidance. And they saw avoidance in the eight to nine week puppies. Um, so it was, it did demonstrate that a, a shock did cause avoidance. Um, and then there's uh, number 16 in our reference, um, Casey et al, that's 2014 um, published paper on human directed aggression in domestic dogs, uh, occurrence um, in different contexts that would be um, they found the use of uh, positive punishment, punishment and negative reinforcement based training methods was associated with an increased um, chance of aggression to the family and unfamiliar people when used. And then another um, Schindler, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name at all in 2004, that's um, number 19 on our reference. They actually used, uh, it was Schutzhund training um, using shock collars, uh, and they were looking at short-term and long-term behavioral effects. And uh, interestingly, which it's not a surprise, they concluded that the training was stressful to the dogs, uh, that um, I believe they may have used a biomarker, cortisol, I'm not sure, I'd have to look at that again, but I believe so. In any event, what they found was that the learner, the nonverbal learner, the dogs, were um, in the presence of their, it was just the actual presence of the owner and even the cues that were used caused the animal to distress. And so it may be that um, we start to see phobias develop as a result of using shock collars and aversive. So yeah, so we referenced, a, um, there, and there's a ton of material that we reference, but those are specific ones that you could share. Perfect. Those are yeah. perfect. The proof is there. Well, we are at the 430 mark, and I want to thank not only our panel of expert, well, experts for joining that, us. 
please note that our wonderful informatics person, Ian Dinwiddie, just joined us after being taken away. We explained, Ian, that you had to be dragged away by your boss screaming to finish some work for the day. And um, Vivian nicely covered the um, stats section by reading it to us, which was interesting and very complicated. But um, thank you for that. Well, thank you for covering that. Um, if anyone has any stats questions, um, if they drop them in the chat, I'll take a copy of that um, along with their emails and I can uh, get back to them directly. And I'm going to follow up with everyone as well, and I can give you our whole team's email addresses. So if you have specific questions, you can email any of us and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. And that also includes the few questions that we didn't get to today. So if you did ask a question or you need a question answered, feel free to email us. Um, our next event, this is the teaser I was talking about in the beginning. Our next virtual event is in two weeks on Monday, the 26th, and it's a general question and answer called All About Puppies. So this is an opportunity for people like you, general dog owners, to ask our team of experts the do's and don'ts of puppy training. So this is a real opportunity to get straight from um, the, the brilliant experts we have what to do with your pup. So the group that's attending today, you're going to get the first chance to register ahead of the general public. So later on this evening, you'll receive an email with those instructions along with the email with our email addresses in it too. So um, we expect it to sell out pretty fast and space is limited. So make sure you do get a spot if you'd like one. What uh, time is that, Ali, on Monday it, the 26th? Four o'clock Eastern time, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we're going to do 60 minutes. Um, maybe we'll do a little bit longer if needed. But again, the space is limited and that's what really I'm, I need to stress to everyone. So to, to close a reminder that CCBS is a nonprofit organization reliant on the generosity of supporters like you and donations are encouraged and they do directly support our work. So we hope that you'll be able to make a donation. Um, I will send that uh, link out as well. And, um, and you can also participate in our studies. You can be a participant and, and subscribe to our newsletter and um, you know, participate in the, the studies and you know, help us learn more about animals and dogs so that we can help more dogs. Um, so as uh, on behalf of everyone at CCBS, I thank you again for your time and I hope that you have a great day. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thanks. Thank you.